Hi, my name is Christopher Malcolm, and welcome to Movable Canvas, where we discuss art, cinema, culture, and where all three of those things intersect. In today's episode, we ask the question, is Krzysztof Kieslowski's three-color trilogy, blue, white, and red, the greatest film trilogy of all time? Now, before we even get underway, let me apologize a bit for the clickbaity title. I mean, this is the internet after all, and catchy titles seem to be a requirement. So let me somewhat bury the lead here by admitting up front that I have no idea if Kozlowski's Three Color Trilogy is the greatest of all time. Neither do you. The beauty of cinema is that every work of art connects to an audience member in its own way. And no two moviegoers are the same. But for me, I don't think there's ever been a better trio of films than Kozlowski's own entry. And in today's essay, I'll discuss a few reasons why. Before I get to fawning over blue, white, and red, we should first acknowledge how many great trilogy cinema has produced. For some reason, good things often come in threes and movies are no exception. Many people immediately think of Star Wars when they think of the word trilogy. The two things are almost synonymous. In fact, I'd be hard pressed to find a better action trilogy than Star Wars, A New Hope, The Empire Strikes Back, and Return of the Jedi. Those movies are so good that, there's, that they spawn an entire cottage industry which has raked in enough cash, spin-offs, and merchandising to be considered its own independent segment of the economy. Then again, now that the franchise has had three separate trilogies and has ventured into endless spin-offs for both film and television, can we really only think of it strictly as a trilogy anymore? The second trilogy that comes to mind for most people will be the Godfather trilogy, based on the books of Mario Puzo. That series is so iconic that some 50 years since its first release, so many scenes and quotes from that franchise are burned into the English vernacular that its influence has permeated all segments of society. Going to the mattresses, leave the gun, take the cannoli going to make them an offer they can't refuse. Then again, I don't think anyone would disagree that the legendary reputation of the trilogy of Godfather films relies heavily on the quality of the first two entrants into the series, so much so that The Godfather Part Two is arguably one of the only sequels in film history that actually exceeds the quality of the original. That part is a matter of debate, but I don't think many people would debate that Part Three is not quite up to the same level as the first two. The third contender in my mind is less heralded than the previous two, but in many ways, even more accomplished. Richard Linklater is before trilogy, consisting of Before Sunrise, Before Sunset, and Before Midnight, tells the ongoing story of a romantic relationship. Whereas the first two series we discussed were a space epic and a gangster epic, respectively, Linklater's trilogy is far more humble of presentation. The first film was literally a two-hander with its main characters essentially engaged in one long conversation from the beginning of the movie to the end. It attempted to capture the excitement of young love and the sparks to fly when two people fall in love at first sight. The second film, released nine years later, catches up to the same characters later in life. They are at that time where they are now old enough to have some experience under their belt, yet not so old for it to be too late to change their life trajectories. The final film, unless he decides to make more, shows us the same couple another nine years after the second meeting. Whereas the first film was about romance and potential, the third film is all about reality and to a certain degree regret. It's still very much a love story, but one rooted in what it feels like not to fall in love, but to actually be in love with all the ups and downs that that entails. I should say that I'm actually not the biggest fan of sequels in general. For me, the greatest thing about filmmaking is the ability to tell an original story. You see the opportunity for an audience to walk into the theater and see something they've never seen before. So sequels, which are by definition based on something else, more often than not seem to suffer from a lack of originality. They're usually treated as just money-making exercises, a way to capitalize monetarily on pre-existing goodwill from the first film. They tend not to take too many risks and more or less just give us more of the same with just enough alterations to think we are seeing something different. What I love about all three trilogies that I've discussed so far is that they each presented ongoing narratives worth telling. When Linklater returns uh, to the Before series, for example, those characters are at different points in their lives. Even if the plots were to be the same, which they aren't, the characters would experience those plots differently because they've matured as people. They aren't the same human beings in Part 3 that they were in Part 1. Life has happened, and this new chapter in their story is equally worth telling. The brilliance of Kieslowski's Three Colors trilogy is that the stories are related, but at the same time, they are not. The film takes its color structure from the blue, white, and red of the French flag. The exact meaning of those colors has changed over time, but since the French Revolution, they've often been said to equate to liberty, equality, and fraternity. Much like the ten films in Kieslowski's foundational work, The Decalogue, where the 
10 commandments don't exactly line up to all the 10 films one to one, but are related. So too are the films in the Three Color Trilogy loosely based on the th those three principles of French flag. In the first of the three films, Blue, which is set in France, Julia Pinochet's character is free for the first time and following the death of her famous composer husband. The new widow is trying to navigate the new outlines of her life while still dealing with a number of unresolved issues, not to mention the grief from her previous marriage. The second film, White, is the most comedic. Ironically, it also st stars Julie Delpy, who also starred in the Before series, as the object of affection for Carol Carol. As the film opens, the dynamic of that couple is anything but equal. Del Delpy's character is suing Carol for divorce, and it's clear that the desire to separate is a decidedly one-sided affair. This leads to one of my favorite scenes in film history, where the Polish-speaking Carol Carol, uh, who speaks very little French, is forced to sit in the courtroom for an excruciatingly long amount of time to hear the response to a basic question. The judge in the case asks a simple question, does his wife love him anymore? Now, this would be a hard response to wait for to begin with in any situation, but to have to wait for it while at the same time being funneled through an interpreter must be unbearable. The bulk of White, which takes place largely in Poland, is essentially a tale of a man trying to win back equality in a relationship through one elaborate ruse after another. The final film in the, in the trilogy is Red, which stars one of Kieslowski's favorites, Irene Yakov, as a model who befriends an aging judge after finding his dog in a street. If blue is a drama and white is a comedy, red is somewhat closer to suspense. I, I almost want to say thriller, but it's definitely not that. You're not going to see any gunshots or sudden car chases. Rather, it's a story about the budding of this new relationship as we simultaneously learn things about the, this mysterious judge and some of his idiosyncratic behavior that helped to reveal deeper meanings. Like all great Kislavsky work, the film is filled with side characters and little moments that are open to audience interpretation. This allows us not only to enjoy the basic plot of each film, but also to leave the theater and continue to think about it on the way home as our brains are trying to work out all the little intricate pieces. And I think that's where the genius of Kislavsky lies. He was a big thinker. And, his, and he presents ideas on the screen that are not only applied to the film we are watching, but to larger questions of morality that we could potentially face in our real life. Is the judge in red an ethical man? What was the real basis of Carol Carroll's relationship with his wife? Were they ever truly equal? Is it possible to be equal in a relationship? Is there such a thing as too much freedom, as in the case of Blue? Uh, is it possible for excess to lead to even more suffering? Kieslowski teases such questions without ever actually answering them. His goal isn't to present a morality play. His goal is to raise certain questions that you might not have considered and observe the complexity. I frequently find myself reflecting on the question he poses in, I believe it's episode two of the Decalogue. In that film, a woman's husband falls into, the coma, falls into a coma as a result of an accident. She goes to her husband's doctor and asks if her husband will live or if the husband will die. The doctor, of course, has no idea. He can't say for sure. But when the woman persists, we learn that what was really going on is she's pregnant and the father of the child is not her husband. If her husband is going to live, the woman is going to have an abortion so that he never knows. If the husband is going to die, she's going to keep the baby. Now, the doctor, who's a deeply religious man, has a dilemma. Does he lie and say that he knows the husband will die in order to save the life of the child? Or does he tell, or does he tell the truth? and run the risk of convincing the mother to abort the child. Both lying and killing are immoral, but how do we go about assigning value to which moral is more important than the other? How do we go about choosing the lesser of two evils? I recently had the great pleasure of actually seeing the Three Color Trilogy on the big screen, courtesy of the American Cinematheque here in Los Angeles. Now, even for a cinephile like myself, sitting in a sold out theater for six hours straight, watching those films back to back to back was a physical feat but it simply confirmed for me how I've always viewed the films. Whenever referring to the Three Colors trilogy, I always find myself thinking of all three films as really as one long film. They were even released within months of each other. I have my favorite, White. It's just so funny and the lead is so memorable that it's the one I mostly enjoy. But I always rewatch all three together because they're really all of one piece. You can't fully understand one without the other two. And there are recurring characters and visual motif that connect the films that make more sense when considered as parts of a whole rather than independently. Because of this, it's a series that rewards the viewers for a repeated viewing. There's no way you can catch everything the first time around, 
So revisiting the series periodically leads to uncovering more clues and provides more questions in need of answers. And this is the reason why I'd argue that the Three Colors trilogy could be considered the greatest trilogy of all time. Each film is a masterpiece of its own, but collectively they're greater than the sum of the parts. The films build off of each other to tell a complete story without becoming self-referential. Each has its own distinct reason to exist and none of the three suffer by comparison to the others. Technically, the films are what I call subtly stunning. The frames make no effort to overpower you, but his considered compositions and unique use of lighting to both give each film its own visual signature while tying the three films together is rather a death sleight of hand. The performances are particularly good, and there's a fearlessness in the filmmaking that lets you know that you're watching something not quite like anything you've ever seen before. You're, you know you're in the hands of a master. Now, to be fair, I'm a huge Kieslowski fan. Very little of what he did as a director wasn't, at the very least to me, interesting or thought-provoking. His films offer so much to the cinematic language that a study of his work is truly required viewing for anyone hoping to understand the broader concepts and ideas it's capable to contain within a film framework. And his Three Colors trilogy is a culmination of all those talents into a true masterwork. Unfortunately, we lost the artist far, far too soon. But thankfully, his art lives on, and the questions his films pose are still as vibrant now as when he first suggested them. My name is Christopher Malcolm, and thanks for watching Movable Canvas. If you enjoy this type of content, make sure to hit that like and subscribe uh, button down below, and we can keep the conversation going. I'll be serving up new videos, hopefully once a week, so there'll be plenty to keep you entertained. And more importantly, let me know what you think in the comments. I mean, have you seen the Three Colors trilogy? What was your favorite of the three? You know, which color, shall we say? Where do you rank the trilogy among others throughout Hollywood history? I mean, we mentioned three earlier in the essay, but that's only scratching the surface. What are some of your favorites? I look forward to hearing from you, and I can't wait till the next time we have a chance to chat. Until then, have a great day.